will just start with something. At the first screening in America, we, Hamza wasn't with us. And <laughs> after the screening, I was telling him, like, people were asking about you. They asked me, like, where are you? What are you doing? And he was like, why? I wasn't in the film very clear. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I feel that I need to tell people about what he was thinking about himself when he was in the film. <laughs> Well, I think you will agree that this was a completely shattering and amazing and uh, extraordinary film. And uh, it has won some 20 awards across the world, including Cannes. And uh, it opens on Friday across Britain and cinemas across Britain. And uh, it, uh, it will be on Channel 4 at the end of October. Um, uh, it's it's hard to speak after it, to be honest. It is, even though it's the third time I've seen it, uh, and you see something each time that you didn't see before. And of course, the reality is that what happened to Aleppo is happening still on an even bigger scale in Idlib uh, to built up areas, and particularly to the city. Um, I mean, we'll take <coughs> questions from anybody who wants to ask a question. Um, but do you want to say anything, Ed? <laughs> you I should mean, not start with me. <laughs> I want to start with you only because you did, in fact, have to break it down from 500 hours. Yeah, it was over 500 hours. She's still producing clips, even a couple of weeks ago. She was like, why did we never use this clip? And I was like, oh, please stop. Um, but yeah, it was a great privilege and an honor, to be honest, to be able to work with this archive. She doesn't like it when I say nice things about her, so I have to keep it short, but it genuinely is, I think, uh, I've made documentaries for over 10 years, the greatest archive of documentary film that I've ever seen or been aware of, precisely because, as, as you guys have seen, not only was there all the horror and all the darkness, but there was also so much light and joy and the full spectrum of humanity that exist in these kind of places. I'll just show you more one clip. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my nightmare. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was an extraordinary achievement that she did, and it was a real like honour to work for two long years <laughs> crafting it. And does Sama have any idea? Uh, I, she's. I will speak about the positive things and let Hamza speak about the negative. <laughs> She's so practical girl. You can't really imagine that this girl is just like three years old. She's doing a lot of stuff by herself and doesn't want any help. It's more about really, you've seen like she's so aware of anything around or a lot of things. I feel that she's really like much young, uh, older than what she really should be. And you can. Uh, she's also aware that there is a film about her being there, so she always say like, poor Sama, poor Sama. <laughs> and the, the negative thing which any children has lived through any crisis around the world should live with is the, the nightmares that they are forced to see each, like basically every night. And uh, for that age, like under four years old, you can't tell exactly what they are seeing, they can't ex express themselves well. So it's hard like to, to deal with or to, to manage to treat. So we'll wait until maybe she's like four or five years to, to know exactly what, what she's suffering from at the moment. How are you? <laughs> I've been better. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I'm, I'm quite shocked that we're still able after all of that and all the losses and all the tragedy to like to sit here and speak about it, and sometimes even like smile when remembering some memories. But I think because the main thing that the story hasn't over yet, like they call it post-trauma PTSD because it's post-trauma, while the trauma till the moment is still happening. We're still seeing the Al-Quds hospital is still working in Idlib and still threatened to be targeted at any time. Since last April, more than 50 health facilities was destroyed in Syria. Since last April, 
the number of children that was killed during that time is more than the number that was killed during the total year of 2018. So it's, it's more intensive at the moment. And I think that's why we, we still haven't got the time to, to think about like, what are we doing, what are we going to do, and what the, the size of loss we, we have got. I think that the film provides evidence for war crimes in, a, in an absolutely uh, crystal clear way in that there was this systematic uh, determination by the Russians and the Syrians to bomb medical facilities. Yeah. And that's illustrated very, very clearly in your journey through the various buildings that you converted into uh, hospital facilities time after time yeah. they were bombed. And it's not just about Aleppo. Like why we were working on this for two years, we've been watching like Al Ghouta, another city in Syria which was also displaced and they were targeting the health facilities there. There was also like Dara and like as we're speaking really there's many as Hamza mentioned, like the number of facilities that have been targeted in Idlib. And we had a screening at the UN in America last month and until now, the, all the governments around the world, they can't say in very direct way to the Russian or the, to the uh, Assad regime that you are targeting hospitals. They are until now saying that hospitals being targeted. Like they can't say who's doing this. And until now, the first step of what they are just trying to do as activist or organization who's really care about people, they are asking for open an investigation to like investigate who's doing this and what is going on really on the ground. So just like one example of how far and how the gap is between the reality and what's going on on the ground and what the policy makers are trying to do all, uh, around the world. And in the meantime, the, the crisis in Syria has, has now slipped beyond the back page. Um, and actually, every one of us here has the capacity to do something, and that at least is to use the social network to alert people not only to this film, which is very important, the most, the most important is that enormous numbers of people see it, uh, we, we know that, that even of the online material that we have published, that half a billion people have consumed it. And we can do more by using your own accounts uh, to press people to see it, to catch it in the cinemas, uh, to catch it on Channel 4, um, and indeed, of course, to use it to uh, get people to bring it back into the forefront of human understanding across the world, because this is an absolutely terrible and continuing atrocity, which is simply not being addressed. Yeah, it's like for, I will speak personally and maybe on behalf of some of Syrian people who've been through the same experience. Like we, we all like lost faith of the governments, but what we still have like faith in the people. Documentaries and films will not change the world, but people like people like you, everyone can do something and everyone can lead part of this action to make difference around the world. What we really need, it's just like you believe that all together we can do something and we can go forward for maybe one step of accountability to not tell this, the story in the way that this is, didn't happen. Unfortunately, until now, most of the media and even and on Wikipedia, for example, they said about the Syrian crisis or the Syrian conflict, the Syrian revolution, as we say it as Syrian, it's a civil war. And just simple things about the shift the narrative of what the Syrian story is. And we need all, all of you, your help with this. And I'm sure like one day we will see something we can all trust that this is the right thing to do. And and we're just hoping, you know, that one of the things that this film does, because so many people think about Syria, they think about Syrians just as like terrorists or refugees. And what we hope that this film does is it really shows just the humanity that we share with people in Syria. You know, I have this thing, this line, which is we are all Syrians. You know, the Syrian people were fighting for our values that we didn't even know were at jeopardy before we were fighting for them. And you think about what's happening in our country today and just think about how much of that owes to 
to the rise of ISIS and the refugee crisis. And that, those crises occurred, in my view, because of our inaction, because of our failure to stand and support people like Wad and Hamza at the beginning when we had a chance to do something. Um, so yeah, I just think in this world that we're living in, we are all fundamentally connected now, and we can no longer say that's happening to those people over there, and we're okay over here. Like, I think there are, there are a lot of like research institute that can address it, but from my point of view, that in the first two years, the, or most of the Western governments want to help the Syrian people, and it was clear on the media and the governmental speech about the, the protest there, the dictator that using like uh, violence against this, the unarmed people, and even when the people start to, to carry weapon to fight back, they also, like in 2013, all the Western media was also saying that this is a revolution and people are fighting to live in dignity and freedom. But then everyone just became afraid of ISIS, and then everyone was in Syria, like all the situation in Syria, all the issues was only about ISIS, and the Western countries and governments and people start to just focus about this issue and forgetting everything about the people who's living there and they're trying to, to still fight for their dignity even against ISIS and al-Assad regime. And big part of this was the propaganda that the Russian and Assad regime were trying to do during the whole things. And the fact that in 2012, the Assad regime like announced for the, the world outside and for Syrian people that they will clear their presence. And as they, w they were like arrested thousands of activists who were like freedom activists and revolution activists, they were also uh, like releasing the leaders who became later like leaders of al-Nusra or ISIS. So it was just part of their battle, which they felt that they can't really destroy the people who's uh, uh, seeking for freedom, but they can start to shift the narrative of what's happening and try focus about ISIS and al-Nusra and the Islamic group and more about what was happening really in Syria. And can I just add as well, I think one of the things was that people didn't want to make the mistake of Iraq or Libya again, you know, and they were worried about going in and making things worse without realizing that Syria was totally different because it was people like these guys who were standing up and peacefully protesting and yet being met with this extreme violence, you know. And I, I think one day we're going to look back on this and our failure to stand up as like an act of appeasement that has emboldened the fascistic dictatorial powers around the world. And you know, we talk about hospitals, but we also think about chemical weapons. All of these rules that used to like be standard in the world have now been erased in Syria, and that affects us all. Like the first thing about how I shoot all these things, and there was really no plan of making any film, and everything I was doing was just mixed between like a mother who's documenting the life around in a very normal way as any person who's not doing uh, filming before. At the same time, like I was trying to play that role of, okay, I'm citizen journalist now, I know how to, to film this. And I was trying like to capture as much as I can one, like some of these cinematic, let's say, scenes. And uh, I, I didn't really knew how much footage I have until we were left. And I was trying to like go uh, rush and like catch all my hard drives and doing all this like okay I need to take this and this and this, and then when we were sitting together and I was like showing Ed all this archive I was like oh wow I did something really good. <laughs> <laughs> there is no time really there to think about okay what I've done and did I like everything was just like some ideas in my mind and I was just like keep capturing this. But I've never thought like I've got the, the whole picture and you can't take the whole picture. It's just five years of like thousands of story. You feel that you need to tell them all and how we put all this together. It was just like some of the long, nice discussions. between <laughs> and, and Great cultural discussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was uh, the first time we break everything down from 500 to 300. It was so easy for him. It wasn't <laughs> easy for me at all because everything I was like, no, but this is 
important. This there is was a like good four story. hours of her peeling aubergines, and she was like, "This is great stuff." <laughs> and we were like, "Okay, has anything happened in the third hour?" And there was like an Aleppo Amdram performance as well, and she was convinced the rehearsals, minute by minute, were high quality stuff, uh, and it was good. But... Yeah, and when we were, when I was showing him this, I was like, he was like, "Yeah." Then I was like, "Wait, wait, there's something so important coming." <laughs> Yeah, one of our editors is in here, Simon, as well. Yeah, he was I want to like, thank you, Simon. Where are Where's you? Simon? Where is he? There he is. We should say as well that everyone has a favorite scene that they that couldn't be included. You know, even right at the very end when we were just about to finally lock everything, two years, finished, done, Hamza perks up. Like, I, just tell me once again why we don't have that scene in. <laughs> it's like, Hamza, please stop. <laughs>